A group of men in religious vestiges sit in rows in the corner of the basilica. Another stands, wrapped in black, staring impatiently towards the doorway from his pulpit. To his relief, the large wooden doors swing open and several men carrying a body soon enter the room. They lay on a painted throne next to the pulpit. The man in black proceeds to lambast and condemn the man sitting on the throne. A young deacon tries to defend the corpse, his voice cracking, every word sounding weaker and weaker. And this goes on for some time before the ground begins to shake. Stones creak and the body rasp as it slumps in the throne. The men look at each other in worried acknowledgement, trying to unravel whether this was divine intervention or sick coincidence. Nevertheless, the trial must proceed. And today's episode is about the corpse sitting in that throne. His name was Pope Formosus, and this is how his cadaver was put on trial. Not once, but twice. Alright, so to begin today's story, I need to get into a little bit of the history of what was happening around 9th century in Rome. It also involves our favorite privileged prophets of pointy hats, the Pope. Now, the Roman noble families at the time, they basically acted as aristocracy. And with the help of the local militia, they intended to keep all that power. The Pope would be able to name the successor to the throne. And the aligned family, they would go ahead and be able to stay on top. So you got a myriad of organized crime going on. This was an unfortunate spot for many of the popes. If you're not aligned with the right person, you could find both yourself and the papacy soon ended. A few of the more gruesome ways they've been assassinated included smothering with a pillow, being poisoned and then having his head bashed in, and then having his face parts and his hands removed. So even if everyone wanted a pope, you didn't necessarily want to be a pope. And it was against this backdrop where Formosus had existed. And it begins with him being Cardinal Bishop of Porto Santa Rarina around the late 800s. He was sent to Bulgaria and apparently did so well they actually wanted him as Archbishop. And the Pope refused this request as you can't exactly be an Archbishop and hold the same position in two different areas. Looks like they had made that rule previously in order to keep them from holding too much power in the fiefdoms. And it was during these travels that he met Arnulf of Corinthia, a king who would be pivotal in the fight against the current Italian king. As you would have guessed, he was both a rival to Formosus and the family he represented. This led to a new pope being crowned, and Formosus hightailing it to Rome in order to avoid the accusations being slung at him. And what accusation was that being thrown at him? It was corrupting the Bulgarians. Apparently, they didn't want any other archbishop but him. The current pope could not have that. Formosus didn't exactly want that kind of heat, so he crowned Arnulf king after Arnulf had successfully invaded Rome. And unfortunately, soon after, Arnold became paralyzed and died before he was able to finish his job with the previous king. Formosus soon followed him. And we're just gonna go ahead and skip ahead of Pope to Stephen VII. The family dynasty he belonged to was said to have a near physical hatred for Formosus. And there was some political significance in smearing his name as he had gained some bitter political enemies during his time. So Stephen had his body exhumed from the Basilica of St. Peter then he stood trial for three crimes. And these crimes were 1. Perjury 2. Coveting and trying to usurp the papacy and 3. Violating church laws. They also threw in the bit about trying to be archbishop of two different places at the same time. So the accusations sound pretty familiar, right? This is where we get the cadaver synod. Formosus' lifeless corpse was held trial in the same place that was also laid to rest. His body placed in pebble vestments before it had been carried to the throne. And the whole trial was a theatrical shot. Stephen screamed insults and condemnations at the lifeless cadaver before him. A teenage deacon was assigned to defend Formosus, but could only muster a weak defense under a faltering voice that quaked with fear. The clergy watched on in appalled horror. And after Stephen's mocking tirade had concluded, Formosus was found guilty of all charges. Of course. And the bit in the beginning about the earth shaking wasn't exactly for a theatrical effect. There actually was an earthquake in the middle of the trial. He was stripped of his papal garments and had three fingers on his right hand severed. And these were the same fingers he would use to bless others with. Formosus would then be soon put in layman's clothes and thrown into the Tiber River. Humiliation was the modus operandi of the day. None of this would go well for Stephen VII. 
The outrage that he caused in Rome over the treatment of the defenseless corpse caused an uprising. Stephen was ousted and soon was required to wear monk's clothes after being in prison. Shortly after that, he would be strangled. And sometimes it just does not pay to be petty. The succeeding pope in his illustrious 20-day reign would annul everything that had happened during the Cadaver Synod, and Formosus' name was restored along with his corpse. Luckily it was found by a farmer, or monk, fitting the source, and was buried in a common grave near the river. They dug Formosus up once again in order to be buried in the basilica, and the pope after him would make a decree so that no posthumous person would ever have the indignity of standing trial. And this lasted a few years before Pope Sergius III took over. And this guy was known as being dismal, disgraceful, efficient, and ruthless. So you know, all the things you're looking for in a pope. He's also known for being the only pope to have his predecessors killed and also birthing an illegitimate son. So you know, a real overachiever. And this human trash bag and appointed hat decided to reinstate everything that Stephen VII had done in the Cadaver Synod. And even going as far as adding an epitaph to Stephen's tomb in order to reinforce his truths. Sergius was also a member of Stephen's family with a strong anti-Formosan stance and a violent hatred for the parish pope. He was even one of the co-judges that served with Stephen on the Cadaver Synod. It was with Sergius' decree that would last hold, and the prosecution of Formosus would stand. Even though the formal law of this order would perpetuate, many scholars believe the Cadaver Synod to be a grotesque monster of a sham, and Formosus to be completely vindicated. Considered to be a legit pious man, and his detractors to be raving madmen. And I know we live in a time period where real trials have quickly become three-ring circuses and reality TVs have started muddying the waters. But I've yet to see a carcass ignobly stand trial for a stark lunatic. But hey, there's always next week. Thank you for watching Shadows of the Past. Be safe everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.